welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Maus. I'm the head of educational grants and projects at the Association of Jewish Refugees, the AJR. We are once again very pleased to be co-sponsoring tonight's event with Insiders Outsiders. Uh, in particular, this uh, this uh, fortnight of, of events that are in the run up to and marking uh, next week's Refugee Week, which is a very fitting time to have these conversations about the contributions of Jewish refugees and things adjacent to that. That's very much at the core of what the AJR is about. For those of you who aren't familiar with the AJR, we are mostly a social welfare organization that supports uh, refugees and survivors of Nazism. If you know of anyone who could benefit from our work, please do get in touch. You can visit our website at ajr.org.uk. And aside from that, we're very pleased to sponsor a range of educational and, and cultural events such as, like, such as this. Uh, and we've been um, supportive of uh, Insiders Outsiders since, since it was, I think, just an idea. And we're very pleased to have done that. And um, tonight looks to be another great event uh, with Sybil Oldfield and Caroline Moorhead. So um, thank you for joining us. Just a few very quick uh, housekeeping details. We, um, as usual, we keep everyone on mute. Um, that's just to reduce the, the background noise. Um, this event is being recorded to go on both the AJR and the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channels. So um, there is a possibility that you might be on that recording. If you prefer to not, not be on the recording, please do just switch off your camera. We will be, uh, as always, having uh, opportunity for questions and answers towards the end of the discussion. Um, the person who will be fielding those questions is Monica Bomdugin, who you'll see in the chat box. So please do direct any questions to Monica um, so that she can direct them to our two speakers for tonight. I think that covers all the important things. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Monica. Lovely. Thank you very much, Alex, and a warm welcome to everybody for what promises to be a completely uh, fascinating event. Um, as the initiator and then the director of Insiders Outsiders, my main aim, in, well, in the first instance anyway, was to pay tribute to the extraordinary contribution made to this country's culture of those who found sanctuary here from Nazi-dominated <coughs> Europe, excuse me. Um, but of course, that also must include a a tribute and an acknowledgement of the key role played by those who gave succor and support on all sorts of different levels to them when they when they arrived on these shores. And the Black Book, Sybil's extraordinary book, it's spine chilling and mesmerizing at one and the same time, is very much about bringing those two kind of groups of people, if you like, together uh, in the pages of, of, of one volume. But let me start by saying, first of all, a little bit about Sybil herself, and then also about Caroline Moorhead, who will be her interlocutor, perhaps is the word. They're going to be in conversation together. So Sybil, first of all, was born in London in the late 1930s. She was the daughter of a German mother from a pacifist socialist family and an English father who was also a socialist and an anti-militarist. She emigrated with her family to New Zealand when she was only 10 years old and only came back to Europe in 1960 at the age of 21. She then taught English and women's history at the University of Sussex for nearly 40 years and has also been active in the CND, the nuclear disarmament movement, focusing on psychological disarmament during the Cold War period. Over to Caroline. Caroline's a well-known writer, I imagine many of you will know of her. She's written a number of biographies and books, mainly on French and Italian 20th century history, the most recent being a quartet on resistance in Italy and France in the years leading up to and during the Second World War. She's now writing about 20 years of fascism using Edda Mussolini, Mussolini's favorite child, as her narrative thread, and I very much look forward to that book for one. She's also written about human rights, both as a book in the form of a book, Human Cargo, A Journey Among Refugees, and for a whole range of different newspapers. She used to be a journalist on The Times and then Independent, and The Independent, sorry, uh, has written and co-produced programs on human rights for the BBC and writes reviews for various publications. So a very appropriate person to be in conversation with Sybil. So over to you, Caroline, to set things in motion. Thank you so much. Um, that's a very nice introduction. Um, Sybil, this is a wonderful and very intriguing title. Can you perhaps start off by telling us what exactly the Black Book was? Oh, well, it was really two books. It was, on the one hand, a list of names 
which were put together by the Gestapo in between 1936 and 1939, September. And of those, it was called in German the Sonderfahndungsliste, the most wanted list. The people who were absolutely, they were, I had to get first, yes, yeah? whom they defined as the enemies of Germany. They never called their enemies anti Nazis, only anti Germans, yes. Yeah? And so they made these two lists. One was of individuals and one was of institutions and trade unions, uh, artists, gatherings, anything that they feared as anti-fascist, yeah? And they were going to have to eliminate fast. Uh, but the Black Book, uh, it, I had to divide up these lists of names because people just can't go through long lists of names. I had to put them into different categories. I felt just for trying to understand who were these people and above all, what was their work and what did they say? And the categories I divided them up into were, first of all, the most humane people, because these are heroes of humanity, actually, the ones that Nazis wanted to get rid of, as you can well imagine, the ones who stuck their neck out to, to defend the people at risk. Uh, and so there were medical men and women, there were refugee rescuers, there were social reformers, and I call that section gunning for the kindest. Yes? And then uh, another section on the list I've put together were so-called degenerate artists. That, of course, is a Nazi phrase. Um, and then the publishers who dared to publish anti-Nazi books, even one book, then they were on this forbidden list. Um, then the creative writers and the journalists who were on their blacklist. Perhaps, Sybil, we, sh we should go back a bit and start before yes. we get into the categories. Yes. Um, could you perhaps tell us a bit who exactly was responsible for drawing it up? The Gestapo. Who, the Gestapo. Mm. Was there any one particular person? Well, we don't know. I mean, there was, at first there was a man called Wolfgang von Christian, but he disappeared off the scene. Then there was another man who um, took so-called credit for it and was very proud of it. Um, but it was clearly, in fact, not a one-man list. It had to be put together by a great many people, and uh, then other people claimed that they'd done it, yeah? And uh, they must have spoken English. The, the, the Gestapo people who put it together must have been English speakers. Yes, so the, the list itself is in German, yes? Okay. Yes. And there were other black books, weren't there, for other countries? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. I mean, you name it. Poland, Czechoslovakia, wherever the Nazis were going to move in, they prepared the ground by having a list of the people they were going to arrest, first of all, and get rid of. <laughs> yeah. What surprises me is we haven't heard more about these black books before. I mean, it, it's not really common knowledge, is it? How did you come on it? How did I find out about it? Um, yeah. I can hardly now remember a time when I didn't know about it. But um, <laughs> it, it seemed to me absolutely obvious that uh, if you're planning an invasion, you're also going to plan whom you're going to arrest right away, and this was it. And so what I did was I knew that there was this list, and I went to the British Library, and to my great pleasure and happiness, there it was. But of course, you can't borrow things from the British Library. But luckily, luckily, there was a copy that you could borrow um, from Boston Spa, you know, the adjunct of the British Library. And I got someone to photocopy it. I didn't ask permission. I didn't want to be refused permission. Uh, and it was anonymous, it was criminal. I didn't see why I should ask permission to have a look at who had done this list of people to exterminate, frankly, yeah? And when I started looking at the list, I don't know whether you wanted me to talk about that at all, 
I was just overwhelmed by how marvelous these people were. Mm. And so I got more and more into it. The very mm. first time I heard of it, if, if you're interested, was at an exhibition on Virginia Woolf and Leonard Woolf, where it was lots of visuals about their lives, all of which I was really fairly familiar with, as we are with the Woolf. But there was one item I wasn't familiar with, which was a facsimile of the page in the Black Book, which in German, and in German Gothic script, was put in Leonhard Wolf, Schriftsteller, writer, and Virginia Wolf, Schriftstellerin, woman writer. And there they were. And I thought, my God, you know, that you should see that. And that then I wanted to know who else was on this list before them course. and after them. And then I went ahead. Of course. Was the book actually black? Did it have black covers? Oh, no, no, it was, I mean, not at all interesting, and I show you. So why was it called it's Black? more boring. No, I mean, it it's just... Uh, um, Do you know why, why it was called Black? Well, um, because it really was threatening death. I mean, that's what it was referred to as by the anti-Nazis afterwards who discovered that what, what it was and were duly horrified. To them, it was a black book. Yes. The, the, the listing of all the best people in their lives and they wanted to get rid of. Now, you were drawn to this, and you say you'd known about it forever. Can you just give us a bit more about your background? Because Monica talked a little bit, but a little bit more about why particularly this had resonance with you. Oh. Well, I'm half German, and that means you live with that. You live with German history. And I was very lucky because my German family were actually pacifist socialists, and they were under Schreiberbord, and they were, my grandfather lost his job as a teacher, as being unfit to influence German youth in its hour of destiny, because he told the boys, he was a math teacher, he said, could he please speak about something not math? He told them how he'd fought at the Battle of Verdun and how he'd heard the German soldiers were all around him screaming for their mothers. And that was the truth about war. And he implored them not to be seduced, he said, a second time by military claptrap. So instantly he was reported by a student who'd heard him. And then he was sacked as unfit to influence German youth, and he was allowed to look after little girls. Couldn't be a danger to them, right? Sybil, I hate and Caroline, apologies for in interrupting, but various people have commented that the sound, Sybil, on at your end is slightly muffled. And I just wondered mm. if you're able to get closer to the microphone or to the computer. I'm not sure where the microphone is, but I'd appreciate it if you could just right, I'll try. Tell shift me your position slightly. Can you tell me if it's better? Or I don't quite know how to get much closer than this. No, that's if that's the best you can do, then so, so be it. Sorry to interrupt. Um, Sybil, go on, talk a little bit more about your 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 parents and your background, and and how this in particular was important to you. Right. Well, as I say, my German grandparents were pacifist socialists, and they said to my mother when she was eighteen, nineteen, and finished school that she was the one who could get out of Germany because she could speak English and was good at languages, she could get a job and she could make a base which would be a refuge for her little brother so he'd never have to kill for Hitler because they were absolutely certain there was a war coming and he would be in it, yeah? And that's exactly what she did. She got out and became a translator and personal assistant in the German English firm Bosch in London and she got her younger brother out, who was only 16 at the time, and uh, just when war was declared, she sent him off on a bike ride around Britain. So when the Home Office came along and said, you know, you've got a German living with you, we want him, um, she said she didn't know where he was, he was on his bike. And the Germans, in fact, wanted him to return to Germany to enlist. But he never did. In fact, he was arrested by the British, of course, because he was an enemy alien. And he was given the option of becoming British because he was so young, he was only 18 or so. And um, 
and he felt he couldn't because he would put his parents in jeopardy back in Germany if he voluntarily became a Brit when they were at war. Yeah. yeah. So he was in prison for six years in British camp. Yeah. It's such a long time, that. A, a, a terribly yeah. long time. Well, it was 1939 to 45, yeah. Long, long time. Now, to go to the Black Book, um, mm. it, as you say, it's two books. If we just look at the first one, the 1937 mm. to 1939, mm. it has 2,619 uh, 2, names mm. and about 400 institutions. Mm. Now, can you talk a bit, first a bit, maybe first about the institutions, what kind of institutions were on this blacklist? Well, they were quite extraordinary. <laughs> Um, there were publishers, obviously, publishing houses, um, church institutions, Quakers. They didn't like the Quakers one bit because the Quakers didn't like fascism. Um, or there were all kinds of institutions. I mean, if you think of every single trade union, for instance, and they put trade union after trade union down, and they put every branch of the uh, Transport and General Workers Union and called every trade union Marxist, yes, as a way of justifying putting them on a black list. Of course, some of these trade unions, like only Bevan, would have been very surprised to be called a communist or a Marxist. He wasn't. Um, what else were there? Um, there? There were, were museums. I mean, I yes? was very struck by the extraordinary thing of finding art galleries for art museums on it. Yes, well, because they accused them of having German, having looted German culture. Oh. They wanted to reappropriate it, yes? Yes. That was it. And also having Jewish portraits in the National Portrait Gallery. <laughs> and also things like the Boy Scouts were on it. Sorry, which? The Boy Scouts. The Boy, oh yes, well, that was very important because they were quite convinced that the Boy Scouts were a secret military spying organization used um, by the government for that purpose. And in fact, they cut, shut down the scouts wherever they went. And uh, it has to be admitted that Baden Powell wasn't a military man, you know. Uh, for him, he was making the boys fit to be soldiers, etc. So there was, it wasn't totally and not understandable that to an enemy country, the scouts were breeding young soldiers, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and what about some of the individual names? I mean, we could actually wait for a second and just, just have a brief word about the second list, which was the May, July, 1940, which mm. was the instructions for occupying troops. Now, what, yes. what were they instructed to do? Oh dear, it's not a pretty story. Um, they were first of all going to take all the raw materials they could. They were going to deport all the males to Europe for forced labor um, from age 16 to 50 or something. All British males were to be taken away. Um, what else were they going to do? Well, they were simply going to try to make Britain a kind of colony, if you like, that was going to provide goods and labor for the Reich. Um, and the, the actual people on, on the books, and on the Black Book, um, who were considered dangerous, um, what was going to happen to them? We don't know. It wasn't spelled out. Okay. Uh, they were going to be the first to be arrested. Um, some people say it was quite an amusing list. I don't find it an amusing list at all. I think they were going to be obviously imprisoned in special camps, and I think almost certainly they were sooner or later going to be got rid of because um, they weren't well, fit to live under a, a Nazi Britain. Was there any idea that there were going to be any camps in this country? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. They would set up camps and then they would deport some of them back to yes. Nazi occupied yes. Europe. Yes, I'm sure. Um, now, who would have been in charge of implementing it once they got to Britain? Would it have been the Gestapo? The SS and the Gestapo. The SS would be the practical patch chaps knocking on the door. 
Okay. If they get the list, if they want to get from the Gestapo. From the Gestapo. Mm. Uh, what was it about Britain that the Nazis so detested? I mean, you talk a bit about that in your book. What, what was it in this country that they found so threatening? Well, they didn't like the fact that Britain had an empire, and they didn't. So they were jealous, obviously, and felt that British were terrible, terrible hypocrites because the empire, they thought, and many people would have agreed with racist, was white supremacy. And yet the British were keeping on jeering at the Nazis for being racist, as though they were fine and pure, yes? So that got in the core of the Nazis, because obviously the treatment of India was not exactly non-racist. And this was pointed out by the Nazis. Um, you know, how dared the British sneer at the, at the Germans for racism? So there's that humbug as aspect. Absolutely. What else did they not like about the British? Well, they didn't like the claim to be demo Democrats, when in fact Britain had shut down on democracy in wartime. And um, they certainly, above all, what they, they accused Britain of all the time was wanting to encircle Germany. And they never forgave the Versailles Treaty, for instance, and understandably, if you like, they saw a kind of a conspiracy between Britain and France, and then later Russia, to uh, finish off Germany. Yeah? Absolutely. For them, it was patriotic to be anti-British and anti-French. Mm. Now, I really like the way that you've divided the book into a list of different categories. Mm. Um, perhaps we could just look at a few of these categories. Maybe first of all, start with the creative writers, because you've talked a bit about the wolves, but I mean, there were a whole lot of creative writers on the mm. list. Mm. Can you tell us about some of them? <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, I mean, the ZM Forster, who looked upon anti-Semitism as the worst of all things in his time. Um, there's J.B. Priestley, who was enormously popular, sort of the spokesman for Britain, the writer who is the Yorkshire voice and is broadcast and all the rest of it. Um, and he would be attacking fascism, you see, of course. Um, Golang, the publisher. Uh, Stephen um, Spender. I think you have Stephen Spender on your list. Yes. Um, well, he was very young, of course, then. He was one of the young left-wing poets of the time. Um, and his mother was half Jewish. That's one of the reasons they nobbled him. Uh, and, and there was H.G. Wells? H.G. Wells, yes. Uh, they didn't like him because he was an internationalist and he drafted, I think, I'm sure you know much more than I do, his first idea of this general human rights. He, he wrote more or less on the back of an envelope and was always trying to get humans to back that. So that was not, it, that was, they couldn't bear civil liberty, they couldn't bear human rights. The people who were in favor of them were on their list, yeah? On the list. Um, um, now, you have a very interesting section on medical men and women. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Quite a lot of those were refugees, weren't they? They yes. were Jewish refugees yes. from Nazi-occupied Europe. Um, and of course, who were, went on to play a huge part in this country. Mm. Can you maybe talk about some of them? <laughs> oh dear, what, what questions you ask? Um, I mean, they're so great. You know, their household names as Aunt Chain. That's um, right. Covered penicillin, and what would we have done without that? Um, there's Krebs, another Nobel Prize winner. Um, there are lots of biochemists. Uh, Sir Frederick Dowland Hopkins, who was head of the Dunn Institute in Cambridge for biochemical yeah. research, he recruited Jews. Uh, Jewish specialists. Tell, because, tell us a bit about that institute because I think it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, um, it's in Cambridge. It's headed, as I say, by Sir Frederick Dowland Hopkins, the Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and whereas some refugees were you know, not favour of the month, because refugees often aren't, 
uh, he went out of his way to recruit actively persecuted Jewish scientists. And of course, that helped the Dunn Institute become even greater. Uh, Hans Krebs, for instance, who's a Nobel Prize winner, remembered how Hopkins was the central figure, beloved and respected, and how he wasn't just in biochemistry in the Dunn Institute, he was important in the Royal Society. And what he did was actively shelter refugees. Okay. And of course, of course, they benefited, the Dunn Institute benefited enormously, as indeed the Warburg Institute did for art history. Yeah. How did they avoid getting interned at a time when the British were interning people as enemy aliens? Yes, I'm sorry, was I didn't it, quite get... was it, How did they avoid getting interned by the British? Because as you say, your brother was interned. I mean... My uncle, is, my uncle. <laughs> sorry, your, I'm so sorry, your uncle. Yeah. Um, was it because they, were, they had refugee status? Yes, but it was also partly because of the wonderful woman, Eleanor Rathbone, MP. I'm sure you know of her very, very well. Indeed. She was a force to be reckoned with, and she championed these people who shouldn't have been behind bars at all. And she was very, very clear it was the people who put them there who should have been behind bars. Um, they were the secret sympathizers with right in Germany and so on. So, um, she used to walk through the House of Commons, apparently, with two huge bags. One was the lobbying material for perhaps family allowances to be paid to the mother, and the other was for refugees. And she was almost called the MP for refugees. And she would get up time and again and speak, but she got no voice left. Um, she didn't make herself popular. And she didn't have a constituency behind her for that, you know. Um, but she, she was an incredibly brave, humane voice, and one could be really proud of her. Absolutely. Said, yeah. She was certainly on the list, wasn't she? Um, yes, yes, she was. Yes. Um, she would and, have been. And her partner was, uh, her woman partner, about whom I really know nothing, except that she was her partner. Yeah. Now, before we go on to sort of more general questions, what was the reaction when people got to know about the list after the war. Can you tell us a bit how, how it became known? Well, it was publicized, uh, first of all, in an American uh, agency, news agency found it. And uh, I think then British Army found a copy uh, and it became immediately news that September 1945, six, and it's interesting, the British reaction by the journalists, because the very first thing the British do is laugh. And so they called it amusing to start with. Because they thought it wasn't real? I mean, why did they find it amusing? Good question. Um, I mean, they just thought it was so absurd to have these marvellous people listed, I think. Um, they thought the Germans were out of their minds. Um, there's also relief, I think. There's also just a, an automatic reaction of something which is really very threatening to say it's ridiculous, yes, and try to trivialize it, really. I think that was a mistake. I think it's a very, very serious document, obviously. And, the, <coughs> and we know from wherever the Nazis went elsewhere in Europe and, and actually occupied countries, these were desolate. They're not amusing one bit. No. <laughs> Um, and w what was the reaction generally at the time? I mean, was it much written about? Was it discussed? I'm, I'm talking about the years immediately after the war. Yes, yeah, September 1946 on. Yes, it was. Um, I mean, obviously, it was a, it's incriminating Nazis and so on. It was part of a war crime. Um, and I think it helped people understand the threat of Nazism and brought it back to Britain. And these were the British who would have been the first people to have gone. So of course it did have an impact because it was focusing on Britain. Of course. Yeah. Um, now, more perhaps general and important question. What impact 
did these anti-Nazis, the, the people who feature in the book, both the British born ones and the refugee, the, the asylum seekers, the people who come in, what, what influence did they have on British feelings in the 30s and into the war? Well, sadly, they were convinced they had no influence. They saw themselves as Cassandra. You remember who were telling, cursed to tell the truth which no one would believe. Because nobody wanted to believe there had to be another war. The last thing they wanted to believe after World War I was going to be World War II. But there was. Yeah. And um, so they, these were the bringers of bad news which people didn't want to hear. And tried many, many ways just to say it's exaggerated, it can't happen here, and so on, yeah? Um, so I think the you know, one asked, think of that word Cassandra, and this is how they felt they were cursed to know the truth, tell it, and not be believed. And of course, one has to remember that in the 30s, there were quite a lot of pro German, uh, there was quite and a Nazi strong pro German feeling. Yes, well, pro right wing Germans. I mean, obviously, um, yes, there were. Um, there was the Anglo German Fellowship, which you know, said it was just cultural and economic, but in fact, it was very, very clear that they liked the flavor of extreme, the extreme right. And they thought it would be a very good thing if Britain went that way, too. That's right. Um, I mean, were there many. I'm trying to conjure up the 30s. Were there many, if you like, confrontations between these people who were bringing out news about what was actually happening in Nazi Germany um, and the right? Were there no, meet there, were, there? there were street fights between them oh. in, in London. Um, you know, when Mosley would get his rough spin to beat up the lefties, you know, there, there really were. It was, it was blood in the streets. I was, I think, thinking a bit later, after after Mosley was sort of banned, um, mm. because the you know they were very powerful. These people, they were well known, they were well established. Um, was there a great debate going on? Yes, I was the BBC. There would be. I'm not quite sure. I mean, the BBC is always supposed to tell both sides, isn't it? Yeah. I don't frankly know about how much of the extreme right the BBC gave air to, airtime to. Um, well, I know about the Liberals. Hmm? It was an extraordinary time. Yes. And once the war had come, yes. these well, people then, we're talking about, these anti Nazis who were on the list, yes. um, must have suddenly found themselves much more in favour, if you like. Oh, yes, absolutely. Because yeah. Because what they had warned of mm, had come to mm. pass. Yes, yes. So they must have had a greater audience at that point. That's right. And they were you know, used by the Foreign Office and the whole people realized they were terribly important German speaking anti Nazis. Because, as you know, we're not terribly good at languages. So, on the whole, the British weren't so marvelous at understanding all this German literature. So, they needed the anti Nazi Germans to be working for them. I mean, what is very striking about your book is the number of, of refugees mm. that came to this country. I mean, many of them, but not all of them Jewish. Um, and the contribution they made to what was going on in this country. I mean, just tell us a bit more about that. I don't know where to start or stop, really. It was such a, a varied contribution. You, you name it, they contributed, really. You name any kind of field at all, medical research, cancer research. Um, I've made a whole list of all the discoveries for which we owe them. Um, whether it's schizophrenia or uh, diphtheria or war wounding, a whole list of what they contributed to palliative care and preventive medicine and so on. Uh, that's one, just one aspect, but uh, there's, you, you can't really think of an aspect of life, and it's architecture, town planning, uh, film, literature, journalism, 
the word extraordinary refuge. I mean, I don't suppose religion particularly, because that becomes then Anglican, and how can you then have the refugees supporting that? But Quakers are certainly very welcoming to refugees, very, very supportive. And I, I mean, you know that from the kinder transport, and you know that from, in fact, refugees were given a tremendous amount of help just to get back on their feet by the Quakers. I mean, the churches here um, were were very helpful, weren't they, towards the refugee arrivals? I mean, they were if you, or weren't? well, were I was they? Getting, they were. If you compare yeah. them to say Italy, mm. um, France, I, I mm. felt that. I mean, the Quakers and some of the Anglican fellowship and so on. Mm. I felt that they had been helpful. Am I wrong? No, I mean, you've got to. It, it wasn't general. That there no. were amazing people like George Bell, who um, went out of his way, and Canon Raven. I mean, it wasn't a popular thing of Euro Britain to preach um, welcome to refugees, support for them. Um, and of course, this is very, very difficult because they were Christian pacifists. And yet here they were, faced by this enemy insisting that they have a war, you know. And yeah. so, how can you be both anti Nazi and yet? Still, you could struggle to keep to your pacifism. And they were simply cleft in two very often. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the other point, of course, which is the general point, which is a very interesting one, is what lessons does this show us today? I mean, you make the point that, you know, we need to remember the past. We need to remember what these people were telling us in the 1930s. Mm. And at a time of sort of, if you like, growing nationalism and xenophobia, mm -hmm. uh, we can't afford to forget them. Mm -hmm. like, talk about I, that. I think one of the most important things is the quotation from the moral philosopher Susan Nyman that I end my book with. Yes. Um, she, she says, what can we learn from the Holocaust? She's a moral philosopher from America, Susan Nyman. She says, we can learn to be aware of the beginning. And I think that's you know, really, we've got to be sensitive and quick on the uptake to see the Absolutely. first signs of it starting. Yeah? Uh, be aware of racism, be aware of nationalism. The Nazis went very slowly and carefully to see what the population would accept. Yeah? And we've got to be in there right at the start saying, no, not acceptable. This can lead to that, yeah? So that's what I feel I've learned, to get in at the start, watch the first signs and shout. Do you feel that the trends at the moment are worrying? Well, I suppose people, I mean, it's always, it's always with us. It's, I mean, and, and it's also always understandable that particularly perhaps people who have got a very, very hard time are very conscious of what they're suffering and haven't really got much over from people who may, in an objective way, be having an even tougher time. Now, I'm a privileged, lucky, middle-class English lady, aren't I? Uh, I've got no excuse not to reach out and do everything in my power to help when I see these people who are desperate, trying to get out and get to safety, yes? Yeah? But I can understand other people who've got a much worse struggle than I've got in life, thinking, look, I can't take that on. I've got enough just surviving and so on, yeah? So, you know, I'm not judgmental really about people who aren't seeing the dangers I see in, um, you know, the fear of refugees overrunning us and all that business, you know. I think we've, we've got to say, look, you know, I can see you've got a, you've got real worries, but look, look what's happened before. And there's still, there are things that are so terrible, we just have got to shout when we see them starting up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is one of the most important and interesting things about your book, is really the, the light it sheds generally on not only the contributions of refugees over the years, but but the need for government to be extremely aware of 
of um, of welcoming people and not not turning away too many people, making it all mm. too hard. Mm. Because if we look at your black book and we look at the thirties, we see the terrible dangers. Mm. Yes, indeed. But also we have to have a sense that you know people are thinking about it, thinking what to do, thinking how to get people in, not necessarily put them all into one spot in England or into barracks hidden away, but Absolutely. part of every community to have their own. And, and it was a very marvellous point at one point in a recent year when different councils, local councils, were actually offering to take in refugees. Absolutely. Council by council by council. And that, I think, is the way to do it locally. And everybody can be proud that they know what, well, you know, you should see what we're doing. And you know, I met these people and you know, I've got an extra room I don't use, you know, I can share that and so on and so forth. I always feel it was one of the more shaming things that these camps were set up. I mean, there was a big camp on the Isle of Wight, wasn't there? Yes, yes. And oh, yes. I thought that your uncle was there for six years. It's just unconscionable, really. Well, actually, he was he was deported to Canada camp, finally. You know, that, that's where he spent most of his years as a young man. Um, they, so I think the British policy was to try to get them out of Britain altogether. Um, Absolutely. Get them to, <laughs> to Canada. Canada, and, Australia, yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. Well, listen, I think that's all wonderful, but I'm sure people have got lots of questions. Um, should we turn it over to the audience and see what yes, they'd please. like to do? Yes, fine. I hope I can help. Very Monica. good. Yes, thank you both very much. There are only one or two questions so far, so I'm going to start things off, if I may, and give people a chance to start typing in their comments and questions. Um, first of all, on the question of internment, which is uh, this year, or rather last year, and this year, the 80th anniversary years uh, for that shameful wartime episode. It was actually the Isle of Man, Caroline, just as a point of fact. People, and I don't want to sort of, don't want to correct you sort of rudely, yep. but you know, I think a lot of people don't know enough about what happened. And you talked oh, also about refugee status. It didn't give a damn what, you know, they were refugees, yeah. most of those who were interned, but come the end of the phony war, the British government saw fit to intern every, enemy alien so-called lock stock and barrel for fear of a fifth column etc etc right. you know fairly understandable under the circumstances with the threat of invasion etc etc but nevertheless and you know to this day a, a murky murky episode isle of man and then um lots of transit camps on the mainland here many of them <laughs> terrible terrible and then as you say also many of people were shipped off to both canada and australia which is a story in itself and just for those of you who would like to know more about that we have actually um held a number of of discussions and events to do with internment in the past, which you can find on the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel. But also we are planning a trip to the Isle of Man. Uh, it's Insiders Outsiders, the AJR and uh, Jewish Renaissance magazine for mid-October. So um, you can find that on the Jewish Renaissance uh, website. Also, it's been mentioned in the various Insiders Outsiders newsletters. So that's something worth, <laughs> worth knowing about. Um, I'd like to, um, in terms of question, um, there was a really interesting event, and indeed some of you may have been present at it, just yesterday evening about the Quakers by Mike Levy, who's a fount of knowledge but admits there is still much more to find out. And also we had the input of an actual Quaker, which sounds a bit condescending, but you know it's actually quite hard to find a Quaker who will actually speak out about the wonderful and important and indeed central role that they played in helping refugees. Um, and one thing I discovered myself yesterday uh, a point which I think appears to be a valid one, that one reason why the Nazis were prepared to listen to people like Bertha Bracey and her fellow Quakers in Germany was that post defeat, German defeat in the First World War, the Quakers undertook the greatest, what they call the mass feeding in human history, apparently. And a lot of Germans, it's still within living memory. So a lot of Germans actually remembered the role that they'd played. And the argument has been is that that predisposed them to look favorably on the Quakers' interventions to help Jews in, in, in Germany and indeed Austria as well, which is an interesting one, which doesn't quite tally with the fact that they clearly targeted them when it came to putting the spotlight on, on this country. And I just wondered, I don't know if there's an answer to that or anything you'd like to, to add, but it's an interesting slight <coughs> paradox, if not a, a contradiction. Sybil, I don't know how much you found out about the Quaker side of things. 
well, a fair bit, but uh, the thing is that they sneered at them as called them noble idealists, inverted commas, you know. Um, and they obviously thought that the Quakers weren't living in this world. They were dealing all the time with how you ought to live instead of how, the, you know, the terrible iron twisted realism of the Bismarckian attitude to life. Where you have an iron fist to deal with everything, really, and get rid of the enemy. Um, so, all I can say, really, is that it's a wonderful bit of uh, history and for humans, not just Quakers, that there, there were these people who stuck their necks out, insisted that even these enemy alien Germans were fellow humans, and that it would be a disgrace to treat them as anything other. And, you know, there are amazing stories. I mean, there's one man who went and lived with them in the camps and so on, yeah? Uh, it's in the Isle of Man. Uh, <laughs> I, know, think I don't think I'd have done that. <laughs> they, they, they really went over the limit. Of Is the camp Paris. still there? Is the camp still on the Isle of Man? Or are they... Well, mostly down. boarding houses, Caroline. There were sort of requisitioned boarding houses for the most part. Mm. So that you know the mm. buildings are are still there. Yes, in, indeed. Mm. Um, but I think about the Quakers. I mean, they have a record going right back, you know, many centuries of humanitarian mm. aid. And it was very striking listening to um it's called David Dobson talking that it clearly seems to them a moral imperative to help those in need, which is, is quite humbling, mm. quite, quite wonderful. And obviously there were others too, but the Quakers I think are a uh, shining example to, to us all. Um, yes, some questions coming in here um, from Deborah. Uh, so Michael Carr was taken from Cambridge and interned, indeed as many others were. Um, are Duff and Diana Cooper in the book? There's two separate, yes, one of separate. I didn't get that question. Sorry, Duff and Diana Cooper, do they feature in the Black Book? I don't recall. Um, no? Diana Cooper. I don't... No, I think perhaps not. Actually, that brings me to a question, if I may. I don't want to hog the conversation, but I'm waiting for the questions to come flowing in. Um, being, you know, a visual arts and art historian myself, I was very struck um, in the chapter on the so-called degenerate artists at the kind of... Um, Slight surprises. I think it goes back to what Caroline was saying. You know, you've got names like Kokoschka and perhaps most obviously of all people like John, you know, the arch communist, anti-fascist, John Hartfield. But then suddenly you've got this guy called Eduard Antal, who I must confess I'd never heard of. And it just alerts one to the fact that, was, you know, was there an element of arbitrariness in their selection of, of names across the board, not just in the arts? Well, yes. I mean, of course, we're all in our ignorance. And... They just didn't know every single artist by any means. I think they were stronger on writers and journalists than they were on the visual art um, and on music. Did they use informers? Oh, who, yes. who Absolutely. I mean, it's how it must have. Must know, have. And do, we know, do we know who these people were? Well, I'm sure we don't. Um, they would make sure we didn't. Uh, they'd be anonymous, probably, a lot of them. Uh, they just give information um, from work, play a base, perhaps it was in a trade union, perhaps even at university, there would be some very right-wing students who would uh, actually say, you may be interested to know X, Y, or Z, yes. Yeah. Um, and I imagine the embassy. Oh, yes. And the yes. consul. Yes. Yeah. But of course, it worked both ways because it, within the embassies there were also moles who were working for the left. Very surprising people like Trotsk and so on. Yeah. yeah. Mm. The question has come in, Sybil, about Jacob Epstein. I'm also quite intrigued that he was on that list. Was it simply because he was Jewish? I know that he appended his name to the, the artist, the artist the refugee committee. Who? Uh, Jacob Epstein, Epstein, the sculptor. Oh, Epstein, Epstein yes. Yeah. Um, yes, it was sheer, sheer anti-Semitism. He had and, appended... And obviously also, he was shocking, wasn't he? <laughs> so, you know, you could say gross man, because he wasn't popular, and he, he was he paved the way for modernist 
sculpture of the, of the first who was rejected is just disgusting. No, no, he raised many eyebrows in this country, but he was also one of the signatories, one of the patrons, I believe, of the Artist Refugee Committee. So there is actually yes. absolutely oh, yes. concrete. Yes, he stuck his neck out. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Okay, more questions coming in. Um, Stefan Laurent, interesting figure, editor of Picture Post, as many of you found, yes. founding editor of Picture Post, had been imprisoned earlier in Germany, indeed he had, and believed he was number one on the Black Book list. Uh, one reason he gave for emigrating to the United States, but it seems he wasn't. Um, where where does he stand in all this? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, the thing they really couldn't bear, understandably, was picture post itself. Mm. So they were going to shut it down right away. Mm. Uh, and I guess they didn't think it mattered much about him if they shut down his organ. Um, I was surprised that Laurent wasn't on the list. It's to me, he's one of you know, the great missing name, if you like. Um, but he had got away. Uh, and I think one could only just say, you know, he got out in time, and so perhaps people say, well, we can't put him down, he's already off. I'm sorry, I should have asked, was there a ranking? I don't remember thinking, reading your book, that there was a ranking on the list. A ranking? Was, a, rank, a ranking, who was first, who was second? There oh. was no, was it, it no, wasn't no, alphabetical. No, 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 it was me, I think I perhaps thought to myself, um, you know, these are all top-notch wanted. Sonder Foundling means most wanted, they're, and they were all up there. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling down here. Yes, um, do we know whether the wolves were included because of her degenerate artistic activity, so-called, um, or that, that Leonard, of course, published in the, in the Hogarth Press, um, uh, or, and or because of Leonard's anti-fascist polemical journalistic writing in the 1930s, or both? Was well, Leonard classified I mean, as a Jew? She was a very explicit anti-fascist. She signed protest after protest, you know, her name was always up there. Yeah. Um, so she didn't hide her anti-fascism by any means. And, she got a bit weary of it, and that every day in the post there'd come another petition, another protest. Mm. But she always signed. She groaned but signed. <laughs> um, but of course, Leonard Wolf was Jewish. That was ex an extra, you know, fuel to the fire. Uh, indeed, fascinating. Um, right, another question: Was information collected from letters sent to and from Germany? You mean was the censor opening letters and... Yes, I wonder. I just don't know. You have to ask the Home Office if they'll tell you. <laughs> There's clearly more research, isn't there, to be done. Absolutely fascinating. Oh, surely. Yeah. Indeed. Um, right. Um, I'm doing some research into medical refugees, and this is very specific, who were accepted by Cardiff Hospital in 1933. One of them was somebody called Dr. Samuel Last, who I believe was on the list. Would he have known he was on this list? No, I don't think they did know. They suspected. Yeah. But they didn't know until the list was published. Mm. And Cardiff, I'm afraid, was not marvellous at taking in refugees. Uh, and some, some of them were very bitter about that. And it, you know, it, other, other places were very, very good. Other universities. Manchester was very good. For instance. Uh, Cardiff as the city or as the university? I mean, uh, well, I suppose both. But basically, I was thinking then of university jobs and taking in refugee scholars, you know? Mm. Of course, it's, it's worth mentioning at that uh, point that, of course, CARA, the Council for At-Risk Academics, which exists and is very much needed today, was actually founded in 1933 by, well, I've forgotten who was behind it in the first instance, but I think academics both in London, and I think in, in Cambridge, sorry, my brain has gone blank on, on that score, but, you know, to help help refugees from Nazism to the great, great benefit, of course, of this country, but the fact that it still exists is, I think, very much pertinent to what uh, Caroline and Sybil have been talking about. Um, fine. Uh, Yes, were there any, <laughs> okay, were there any ordinary Jewish refugees on the list? Uh, for example, kinder transportees, children on the kinder transport. Um, did they, did the Germans know, did they keep a record of who had gone to, come to the UK? 
ordinary ordinary refugees? Yes, I mean, I think they, they kept a very close eye and you couldn't get away, really. You know, you were being monitored, watched. And that's one of the things that shocked me was how uh, they were followed into England. And uh, the Gestapo certainly wanted to still to know what was happening and what they were doing and then reporting back. Because what you've got to remember is that that's what security is. Oh, Sybil, you've you've mute. Sybil, Sybil, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, you inadvertently muted yourself. Just click on click on the microphone icon. Yeah. That's, okay. uh, yes, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, that must have been my elbow. Um, where, were, where were we? About, yes, about the Germans keeping tabs on who, who was... Oh, yes, in. yes, mm. yes. Um, they watched very, very carefully. I was quite shocked at how they followed up everybody who got, got out. You know, you weren't safe once you got out. You, you were still on the books. And in fact, some people were assassinated. Indeed, I noticed that Charmian Brinson is in the audience. Charmian, I don't know whether you're still listening in, but of course Charmian has written extensively on yes, that aspect yes, of things. And I yes. don't know whether you'd like to chip in at this point, Charmian. I don't want to put you in a, in a corner as it were, but if you are there and would like to say something, we'd, we'd welcome it. I can't see any more exactly who's here. No? No, I think that that period, you know, from 1933 to the outbreak of war is still, you know, there's much, as I said, much still to be discovered, and it's much more complex. And I used the word murky before. I think it really is, isn't it? It's it's a tricky, problematic period. Um, I think also, I mean, thinking about um, what you were saying, Caroline, or indeed both of you, right at the very beginning, the way that the Germans perceived the Brits as being hypocritical in terms of empire and mm. racist attitudes within empire. I mean, it's that's also an important aspect of what this book has to tell us, isn't it? That actually Britain was by no means a, a perfect place uh, or indeed a perfect haven as, you know, as in the internment mm. episode. It's, it's a sobering matter, isn't it? It really is. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions. It's your last chance if uh, anybody does want to chip in now. Um, perhaps Sybil, I don't know, Caroline, whether you want to run things off, but I curious to know now the book is out there and it really does make a wonderful read and incidentally I have posted I hope you've noticed the link to enable you who haven't those of you who haven't uh, actually read the book or obtained a copy to get a, a nice little discount on it through Primrose Hill Books. Um, uh, right uh, there's another question coming in um, what I'll do is actually also send a kind of round robin email to everyone to give them the link so you have it uh, to hand. Um, yes actually a good question here um, uh, how accurate was the list as many refugees, of course, later moved on to other countries. Well, it wasn't comprehensive. You know, there could have been many, many more people on that list than there were um, from the Gestapo's point of view. But it was quite accurate in terms of these were people who, on the whole, were anti-fascist. They got the right people. There are very, there are a few extraordinary names, people there listed, whom I was really surprised by who were the ultra right wingers. I thought, what the heck are they doing on that? Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, um, I mean, they were anti-Semitic, they were extreme right, but they, they switched. Come the, uh, probably the occupation of Czechoslovakia, then people switched and they, they, made, they gave up on the last. So some of them were being sympathetic. Then they realized that the, there was going to be a war, that there was going to be in, a, a threatened invasion of Britain by the Nazis. And it, if you think, take, for instance, the Daily Mail, which had been a horrifically uh, relaxed <laughs> about Nazism, um, then it suddenly woke up to the fact that we've got an enemy here, and people jumped ship. Many people who deemed as the extreme right suddenly found this was no longer possible with a war against Germany on. And they had to choose. And of course, they, they chose to be on the British side and it became patriotic to be anti-Nazi. Interesting. So and actually, the point you made... Then. 
the point you made earlier, Sybil, also, um, and Caroline, you know, about the kind of dilemma, you know, if you're a pacifist, how can you be in favour of war against Germany? I mean, that's a recurrent motif, isn't it? Very interesting indeed. I mean, in answer to Alan's question, uh, if you read the book, I do recall that there were various people who had actually already moved on, hadn't they, by the time, you know, the list was, was being drawn up. Um, a very practical, perhaps a last question, given the time. Um, how does one get to see the list? Is it published as a complete document? Yes, yes you can do that. I'll tell you how to do it. You go to the British Library and you look it up. The, you don't call it the Black Book, you, you have to call it the um, list, the Gestapo list of the most wanted or something like that. And they'll pick it up for you. And there's one copy you can't borrow and there's another copy you can from Boston Spa. And in fact, what I did was I got the Boston Spa copy and without asking permission, got it photocopied, so I got it to work with, yeah? Um, so definitely, you could, but you do have to go up to the British Library, first of all, and you do have to, I mean, I just ask them, how can I get a copy of this? And uh, there is this Boston Spa copy that can be available, made available to readers. How did you feel, Sybil, as you were physically handling this book? Oh. <laughs> Well, it's not a book, it's, a, it's lots and lots of papers. Papers. You shake, you shake a bit, you know? You really do. Um, it, it's an extraordinary thing. And to, to handle any document that's got the Heim exclamation mark, secret, at the back of it, mm -hmm. you think, my goodness, what, what are they hiding? And then you find out, yeah? And they knew they had to keep it dark. They knew it was dark stuff. The Heim. The Heimstadt Polizei is secret state police, Gestapo, mm -hmm. yeah? The Heim, I guess. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get to know the Nazis, you look at that book. <laughs> and look at your book, indeed. <laughs> Caroline, was there anything you wanted to say by way of rounding off the evening? Well, just to go back to the point you made that there's still so much research to be done about mm -hmm. the 30. Mm -hmm. I think what's wonderful about this book is it's thrown light on something which I think very few people know about. Um, you know, I think you have to be deep into this subject to even have known this book existed. And so it's very valuable in bringing all that to light. Absolutely. And perhaps just one last comment um, from Josephine. Uh, Lord Dubbs, we all know. And love Lord Dubbs, I think, who came here as a kinder transport child, is fighting through his organization Safe Passage to get unaccompanied children here from refugee camps with little support from the government. Uh, sadly, the amazing contribution by previous refugees has been forgotten. Thank you, Sybil, for a very interesting and informative presentation. I'm involved in Holocaust education, so from somebody who knows what she's she's talking about. Very good. So I think we will now say good night with a very, very big thank you above all to Sybil, but also to Caroline for uh, directing the conversation in such accomplished and interesting uh, ways. Um, I will just uh, say that, as I think Alex mentioned at the beginning, this is part of a two week long program of events on a whole range of different topics related to the refugees from Nazism uh, and their cult mostly cultural activities, which goes on. Uh, there's another one tomorrow and extraordinary is going to be a hugely poignant event, which is, I think, relevant here. Uh, uh, a Bauhaus trained textile designer called Otti Berger. She has to leave Germany. She comes to this country. She doesn't thrive. She goes back to her native Croatia, partly because she has an elderly and ailing mother there. Does she survive? No, she doesn't. She dies in Auschwitz. And I think that's a stark reminder of this intermeshed, you know, intimacy between the refugees and the darkness of the Holocaust um, itself. So if you're interested, do look on the Insiders Outsiders Festival.org website in the What's On section. Sign up to the newsletter uh, if you would. And actually, one of the artists, if I can just end up with something very specific, um, Sybil, you mentioned an artist called Siegfried Charu, who I think most of you probably yeah. won't have heard of. He was a communist. Um, um, interesting um, sculptor who comes to this country um, and is on in the Black Book, but we're actually having an event that has actually had to be postponed not once but twice because of COVID, but is now scheduled for the 26th of September. And it's going to be a rather special event because it's actually in the house in Hampstead Garden suburb of all places. It looks a very ordinary house from the outside in which he lived and worked. So do look out for that as well.
Very good. So thank you, audience. Thank you once again, Caroline and Sybil, and good night, everyone. All the best. <laughs>